Thank you, Jason. And it is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, your keynote. Um, Mark Decay, is, uh, his keynote is, is sponsored by the, the Faculty of Architecture Endowment Fund, by the Department of City Planning, and by the Manitoba Professional Planners Institute. Um, Mark Decay is a registered architect. Uh, he specializes in sustainable design theory, uh, research, uh, design, uh, design tools, and practice. And he's taught at the university level since 1992. He comes to us currently from the graduate program in architecture at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And uh, he actually chaired that graduate program quite recently uh, for a few years. His recent work is in integral theory and its applications to sustainable design. And it's there that uh, Mark and I started to overlap uh, maybe uh, several years ago. Um, we actually have never met one another in the flesh until yesterday, but we feel we have been in contact, face-to-face uh, -face contact for a long time, mainly because people who know us in common always say that we should meet one another. And eventually we have, but we share this interest in uh, something called integral theory, and I am delighted that he is here to provide you with an overview of that, because I have never been able to accomplish it yet uh, in this faculty, especially, um, and I'm glad to have someone else to give it a try. Um, he is going to be talking quite a bit about his, his latest book, which I would certainly highly recommend, Integral Sustainable Design Transformative Perspectives. But you should know that he also has another major publication with uh, GZ Brown. It's uh, on sun, wind, and light, uh, architectural design strategies. The third edition of it is being worked on right now and will be, will be appearing very soon. Mark also, uh, it will probably be of interest, he co-edits and manages with uh, Professor Richard Kelso, a highly successful uh, university, uh, UT Red Vector Online Continuing Education Certificate in Sustainable Design and Green Building. And that one is for registered design professionals. Um, Mark uh, has his presentation title up there. Uh, we have until 2.30 for the combination of the presentation and Q&A. And uh, I'll now happily turn it over to, to Mark. Uh, to provide his keynote. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right with the volume? Great. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, we are really excited to be here um, with all of you and with this kind of topic of architecture, design, ecology. It's really, it's really a, a gift for the, to come with this invitation. Uh, I'm also here with my wife, Suzanne. Um, and I'm going to uh, bring Suzanne up here to give us a little framing of the talk. And then she'll also be working with me in the Q&A. So S Suzanne is not only my wife, she runs my research lab. She's my intellectual partner. And she's also the editor of this new book. Uh, and I say that, you know, she's really the one that's, if there's any intelligibility um, and readability in the work, uh, she's responsible for all of that. So, uh, Suzanne, will you get us started? Well, that was a nice introduction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, honey. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the way that I'd like to set this up is to invite you and to request of you as you listen to Mark's presentation, to listen in a kind of generative way. You know, there's a number of different ways that we can listen. We can just sit there kind of passively and let stuff roll over us. Um, or we can sit there and then just kind of get excited when we hear something that relates to whatever it is that we're particularly interested in. But particularly with regard to getting anything from this talk, we've only got an hour, we're probably not going to be here again soon. This is our moment. <laughs> this is our time. And uh, uh, so the invitation is to listen with kind of elephant ears. 
and, uh, and an open mind and an open heart. All right, so um, because some of this work really requires you to throw yourself up against the wall and rearrange your molecules. It's not easy, so if your brain hurts, that's good. That means it's working. Uh, and in the process, please feel free. I, I would really like everyone to shut off any kind of electronic devices. All right, and as a group, really let's constitute ourselves as a generative group here to actually discover something together. You know, here to help each other listen and hear. Uh, and that really requires, you know, not answering your boyfriend's email or whatever, you know, texting or whatever, Pinteresting or whatever people are doing. You know, I'm old, so I don't do all that stuff. I have one of those stupid phones. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that, that is my request. Of course, you don't have to, to accept it. Um, but if we do listen as a generative group, I assert that something else will come out of our being together in this, um, in this hour. So with that, I'll give you back to Mark. Thanks, Susie. So I want to give you a little bit of a, a story about why I came to and how I came to thinking about integral design and integral ecology. Um, I've spent a lot of my career up here in this upper right um, sector of this, these four images here in uh, dealing with the realm of performance in buildings. So uh, I've, this is a book that's uh, represented about 10 years of effort and four years of concerted writing. The new work is similar. Uh, the new edition is 10 years uh, in the making and four years in intensive work. So, it, so I've spent about 20 to 25 years working with how to improve the performance of buildings and providing design tools for architects and landscape architects to do that. Um, and at some point along the way, I began to ask, why is it that it's so difficult? Why is it that what seems so straightforward and simple and logical and obvious to me doesn't always land on every student in my class? Why is it hit three out of 20? Why is it that all the rest of the professions that I'm dealing with um, aren't really taking this up in the way that I think they should? And I began to realize that there were many different other ways of looking at design than the kind of conversation that I had embedded myself in. And so I had to actually begin to listen to my colleagues and listen to the other ways that people were looking at things. So you could uh, take sustainable design, for instance, and look at it from the standpoint of experience in a building like uh, Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is really a kind of icon of connecting people to the environment. And yet, it's probably the most resource consumptive house for two people, you know, before 1950. Uh, it's 12,000 square feet and, you know, uses single pane glass in a cold climate. So it does some things well, experience, but it doesn't do anything for performance. Then there were also people that were interested in how does that building fit into a larger context? How does it become a part of its ecology? So here's the first lead platinum building that's integrating itself with the water cycle and thinking of itself like an ecosystem. I didn't understand those people either. Um, or the rest of the conversation about larger context. In fact, when I was in architecture school, no one ever mentioned the word context for the five years between 1979 and 1984 that I was in architecture school, if you can believe that. And then there were other people that were interested in the kind of conversations about what buildings have to say to us culturally what they mean, what the symbolic language of, of architecture might be. I had no idea what they were talking about either. So I began to recognize there were many, many conversations going on. And I needed to begin to figure out how to process all of this and put together for myself at least a framework that made sense. Then as I began to look at sustainable architecture, I also found that there were, you know, straw bale buildings and traditional architecture from the vernacular perspective. There was high-tech building. There was Palo Solari with arcology. There was, you know, every, every imaginable thing out there that somebody was calling sustainable in one way or another, and how could you really make sense out of this? And then even, even more. So uh, German high-tech solar architecture, uh, sliding house with a greenhouse and so forth. Um, 
landscape architectural approaches to ecosystems in gardens um, and lead certified buildings that you couldn't distinguish from the next mixed-use office building down the street that used three times as much energy. So I still couldn't make sense out of all of these and that was the sort of the project. And I began to write down, and this is only what would fit on the slide, many, many different kinds of approaches to sustainable design. So if you start looking around at what, what people are calling sustainable or green uh, or anything in that category, there's a hundred or more different disciplines, disciplinary approaches and intellectual approaches and methodological approaches to sustainable design. And that was why really I thought we needed an integral sustainable design approach. Um, about 10 years ago, I ran across the work of Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber is perhaps the most published, most widely read American intellectual writing today, uh, and yet is fairly well, fairly unknown, I would say, inside of, of academia. On the left uh, are a few of his uh, many books, and then on the right, all of these, including journals and so forth, uh, different people in many, many different kinds of disciplines from psychology to ecology to business are looking at how they might apply integral thinking to their discipline to kind of untangle and make sense of these same kinds of conflicts and contested terrains that I was finding in sustainable design. So I want to start with what I call the four perspectives of integral sustainable design. And so the talk today will be really be in three parts. We'll talk about this first, then we'll talk about what I call levels of complexity, and then we'll get into some specifics about um, ecological design thinking. And that's really the theme today. So all the way through here, we're only going to be looking at sort of a portion of the general content, but focus on the topic that uh, you all have come here to think about, which is that intersection of design and ecology. So this is a kind of basic map, a basic model, and it is just a map. And so all of these things that I'm talking about today are not like the truth in the universe any more than the map is equal to the terrain that it's trying to describe. But if you're going to be flying over the Rocky Mountains, um, having some kind of a map is better than having no map at all, and having a better map is better than having a poorer map. So that's what we're looking at. It makes two basic... Whoops wrong buttons. <laughs> it makes two kinds of basic distinctions. The first is between the things that are subjective and the things that are objective. Right? So that's a fairly basic distinction that most people can relate to. Objective things are things that have a specific location in the world. You can see them and point to them and measure them and map them. Right? They exist in the empirical universe. The objective, I mean the subjective, I'm sorry, uh, lives inside of human beings. So it's inside of your own experience, your own mind, your own thoughts and values, and how you interact with other people and groups to arrive at larger concerns. The other major distinction is between the individual and the collective. So parts versus wholes, individual people versus societies and groups, and so on. And the intersection of these two gives us four kinds of basic perspectives. Uh, we call this first one the behaviors perspective, or the upper right perspective, or the realm of it, right? And what it's mostly concerned with is performance. So in architecture, for instance, it's interested in how do you measure the effectiveness and, and efficiency of energy and materials use and things like that. So that's the world view or the perspective of the engineer, let's say, within architecture. From the lower right perspective, that is an objective but collective, or what we might call an inter-objective perspective, and that's the realm of systems, or the perspective of systems. And what counts for value there is how does something that you're considering fit into a larger context. It could be a social context, an environmental context, um, a context of the city or the infrastructure and so forth. But in some way it's looking at how it's fitting inside of something larger than itself. On the upper left perspective, what, what we call the experience perspective, and that is 
concerned with things like individual experience of individual sentient beings, you and me. How do you feel in this space today? If I want to know that, is it hot in here or cool in here? Are you comfortable, bored, etc.? I have no way of knowing except to ask you and trust that you're going to report that to me. So that's what we're interested in in the upper left perspective. And then the one that was the most difficult for me was the culture's perspective. Okay, so that says, what does something mean in the world? And how we know that is that we have conversations, we have dialogue. And so what emerges is the kind of shared understanding or shared meaning. So let me take you on a quick little tour of those. Uh, starting with the upper right perspective, and again, that's kind of where I started off. That was my home territory. Um, I, I like to measure things and count them and calculate them and so forth. And that's the way I began to look at architecture. And so the concerns there have to do with things like energy and water efficiency. If you're thinking about zero energy buildings, carbon neutral buildings, anything like that, that's this perspective. It's high performance. It's the lead rating system. How many people know the lead rating system or have heard of it, right? Absolutely everything in lead is coming from this upper right perspective because it's what you can count, it's what you can measure, it's what you can weigh, it's how much is recycled, what kind of water, how much water are you using, how much are you saving, okay? That's good stuff. I spent 25 years of my life dealing with that. But it's not the whole picture and most of us in, in the professions usually think that sustainable design only lives here. It doesn't. So what we're interested in as designers is shaping form. Mostly what you end up doing, I think, is you make form an organization. right? You shape space and so forth. And so the question is, what do you bring forward in order to help shape that space, in order to help make that form? So from the upper right perspective, the, what counts for value is, is the question, how do you shape form to maximize performance? So, for example, we get things like the solar decathlon projects. Now, these are great. Sort of a building that's unplugged and operates, you know, with no pipes and no wires and is completely self-sustaining and self-sufficient. This is, you know, there's been 50 of these or 100 of these now. Um, but what's interesting is that if you look at something like LEED, you'll find there's no credits out there for whether it's beautiful or satisfying, whether it gives you a rich human experience. There's no credits there for anything other than whether it's efficient. There's no credits in LEED for whether it's actually fit to some ecological pattern or context, or whether that efficiency makes sense in any kind of way inside of an ecological logic. Right? And there's nothing there that's saying, well, maybe a building could establish an important relationship between people and nature. That just doesn't enter the sphere of that, of that perspective on the world. In the lower right, we're interested in what I call shaping form to guide flow. Now, that's not my label. That's from the landscape architect John Lyle, who says, you know, what there is to do is to look at how ecosystems move and all those flows of energy and information and materials, that's what's flowing, and then look at how you organize the form, how you shape the form in order to guide those flows. So we're interested in issues like fitness to context and looking at the building either analogically or actually as an ecosystem. And moving, let's say, from the lead criteria to something more like the living building challenge criteria. So here's an example of that kind of thinking. This is the Center for Regenerative Studies in Cal Poly Pomona, California. And it's a building that lives on its solar energy income, collects and stores its water, recycles it, creates uh, artificial wetlands to process and clean that waste on the site. The students that are being educated here about living ecological systems are living inside the facility. So it's participatory, it's educational, it's symbolic, it's communicative. Um, and uh, and they're growing their food at the same time. So that's a kind of example of looking at the form of the built environment as an expression of the underlying ecological flows that keep things alive. From the lower left perspective, um, I ask the question, how do you shape form to manifest meaning? So there we're interested in how are people and the built world related to nature? 
We raise questions about the aesthetics and the ethics of green design and what kinds of stories we tell through the designs that we make. So just as an example, a couple of uh, two different examples, although they look like they might have be even been done by similar designers, uh, for a kind of visioning competition in Dallas. Um, projects that I think bring forward an att attempt to have some expression about the relationship between the built world and the natural world, growing food, and so forth, and tell a story through that composition of architectural form. Or the upper left perspective, where we're interested in engendering rich human experiences. So those are the perspectives taken by aesthetics. And as I said, in some realms of design, I don't know how it is in your school, but not only did I never hear the word aesthetics or beauty in my entire architectural education, which was both graduate and undergraduate education in architecture, but I can count on one hand the number of times in my entire career and I've been teaching since 1990, um, how many times I've heard beauty or aesthetics mentioned in an architectural design critique ever in anybody's class, right? So these are perspectives that exist and they're obviously a part of the built world, but we don't always necessarily have a language for them. So just as an example, a project by Glenn Merkett, the Australian architect, um, the Marie Short House, a well-known project, uh, which is a very simple project and just, in a way, kind of sits there on the land being passive. But it's passive because it's taken into account a huge amount of complexity. It's taken into account the orientation, the cycles of the sun, the patterns of the wind, the geology, the trees, and everything else. And his stated intention, really, is to set up an experience for people so that they're tuned in to those rhythms and cycles and experiences. So here's another view of that. So we still have our kind of four quadrants or our four perspectives, the realm of the I or experiences, the realm of the we or cultures, the realm of the it or behaviors, and the realm of the its or systems. And this is what Wilbur calls on the left-hand diagram, gross reductionism. So if I'm an engineer and I'm interested, or something like that, let's just pick on engineers for a minute, um, and I take the perspective that the only thing that's valid or valuable in the world is that perspective of, be of behaviors, and I'm only interested in what, how efficient I can make something, then I'm leaving out a whole bunch of things that are important to design. On the other hand, if I'm holistic, right, so I moved from being a gross reductionist, let's say, to being what Wilbur calls a subtle reductionist, or a holistic thinker, or an ecological thinker, right, then what happens is all of the interior realms can get collapsed. So that the only thing that we think is important is that systemic, holistic, ecological, objective view of the world. Now, if we're over there, it doesn't make any of this invalid. You just can't go over here and talk about anything to do with meaning or culture or aesthetics or experience from the point of view of systems thinking. And that's really important because that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be talking about this perspective mostly, and we have to remember that it's one of a multitude of perspectives that are important, and it's valid and true in its own domain, but its methodologies cannot be used and expanded and pushed over into other domains or do violence in any way to them. Now, I'm not the only one to, you know, start talking about this stuff. Um, this is a, a diagram from several years ago by Sim Vanderen, and Sim identifies the concerns of self, that would be our upper left experiences perspective, the ecologic, that would be our lower right systems perspective. The technologic, that would be the upper right behaviors perspective. And the ideologic, that would be the lower left cultural perspective. So then I began to think, well, 
That's great. That explains some of those conundrums that I was in in the beginning and how I could begin to map out why, if I was speaking from one of those value domains or perspectives, people that were really oriented and saw themselves as being uh, thinking from or looking from those other perspectives, why what I was saying wasn't really landing on them, and maybe they weren't as excited about it as I was. But it didn't quite solve everything. Here's a, a, a video that was just released by NASA. And this is the polar ice caps. Starting in 1980, and you can see it goes up and down, and that's, it grows out in the winter and it shrinks down in the summer a little bit. But trending over time, it's moving down from left to right as we go from 1980 up to 2012. It starts off at almost 4 million square kilometers in size. And it ends up, as you'll see in just a second, somewhere around one and a half million square kilometers in size. And so here is the beginning in 1980. Here is 2012, just last year. That scared me to death. And I couldn't quite figure out why that didn't scare everybody to death. Al Gore's been going around for 10 years telling us this. He's been, you know, a spokesperson all over the world, made a movie about it, right? But it wasn't really landing. I mean, why, is, why, why can we see this and get that there's this huge visual picture? And by the way, if you haven't seen the movie Chasing Ice, I've got to put in a plug for that thing, because it is the most beautiful, most aesthetic, most powerful argument for environmentalism and being engaged in the climate change conversation of anything I have ever seen. It's a, it's a, it's a photographer who goes and does time-lapse photography of the changes in the glaciers all over the world over a period of eight years, and it will blow you away. If you think this is challenging and exciting and disturbing at the same time, go see Chasing Ice. So I couldn't figure out why it was that we could see graphs like that. Why it was that we could see graphs like this, which is from the, the organization Architecture 2030, and Architecture 2030 has put out the 2030 challenge to all architects to make buildings carbon neutral by the year 2030. And they've calculated and processed that for North America, architects, if we could make every new building carbon neutral by 2030, that, whoops, that we would follow this kind of a trend in the building stock, because most of the buildings have to be either rebuilt or renovated or made new over, the, over this next couple of decades. And that what we could do is take this business as usual curve where CO2 levels are going up and up and up, and we could begin to bring that back down by 2030 to the 1990 levels. Essentially, we could halt and reverse the effects of greenhouse gases in North America through the construction of the built environment. Right? Now, most logical-minded people can follow a graph like this, but where's the, you know, where's the profession? More and more of the profession are signing on. The AIA has signed on to this, American Institute of Architects, and said, yes, we're going to do this. ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has signed on to this and said, yes, we're going to do it, but we're already behind the, the movement. So something else was going on. I couldn't quite figure out what it was, and it seemed like to me that there had to be another variable, another explanation that would say, why is it that it's so obvious and yet we're still sitting on our chairs? Right? So here's what Wilbur says. Gaia's main problems are not industrialization. They're not ozone depletion, overpopulation, resource depletion, and so forth. Gaia's main problem is the lack of mutual understanding and mutual agreement in the noosphere about how to proceed with these problems. And the noosphere is a fancy word for the, the realm of mind and knowledge, what it is that makes humans different from other animals, let's say. So the problem is us, it's our own consciousness, and it's our own inability to understand each other enough to agree on what it is that we have to get to do. So I began to look at development. And in integral theory, developmental models and developmental sequences are very important. And so we're mostly familiar with uh, this kind of sequence 
Although we tend to associate it with styles and we tend to associate it with time periods, neither of which I think are accurate, what we really have in the progression from a traditional way of thinking about design to a modern way of thinking about design to, let's say, a Frank Gehry postmodern way of thinking about design to a more, what I'll call, an integral level of thinking about design, is we have a shift in consciousness. We have a shift in worldview and a shift in values. And those values, don't get stuck, you architects, on the imagery, but we have a shift in values and worldview which makes possible a new view of the world and which brings forward new possibilities and shows up within the realm of design in different expressions. So I organized it like this and said, OK, we can have at least these four, and we can probably go down. So the traditional takes into account a lot of previous history and previous worldviews. And there's probably things beyond the integral. But mostly, we have these four kinds of worldviews present today, I would argue, possibly in the room, but mostly, certainly in, in a neighborhood meeting or city council meeting or something like that. Right? So we have the traditional in which in the professional structure is embedded in the guilds. We have the modern worldview in which professionals were independent. I was educated in a modern architectural school, and it was all about individual expression. You know, you've heard the term object building, perhaps. We were all about object buildings. The more object, the, the better. The more extracted from its context, the better, right? We also have what you might call pluralistic practices. Most schools of design operate at this kind of postmodern level where there's no longer a single theory. There are multiple theories. They're present at the same time, and you can't put them together, and they don't add up to anything. But they're pluralistic, and your theory's OK, and my theory's OK, as long as we don't bother each other too much. And then the kind of integral perspective is interested in putting that fragmentation back together. right? So I, I call that transformative networking. It's connecting those differences, but it's also transforming that and transcending the individualism of the modern and transcending the disconnected pluralism of the postmodern. Now, we've talked about four different perspectives, and this diagram is only just to say that these four levels, or four levels of complexity, you might say, four different kinds of worldviews can be mapped onto and thought through each of these four fundamental perspectives that we talked about in the beginning. Now, like I said, the realm of ecology is here. And so we're going to talk more about these different levels of worldview as they take into account the perspective of thinking about ecological systems. Here's another way to look at it. And I'm sorry, I have like two or three of these kind of boring, nasty graphics in a row. Suzanne hates these things. But here we are, traditional, modern, postmodern, and so forth. Here are those different perspectives. The exterior perspectives, or this lower right systems perspective, is what we're going to examine. And I'll show you a few examples. So if it doesn't make sense, I'm going to unpack it for you, at least how I see it. So in the traditional level, we have tacit systems. In the modern level, what I call logical systems. In the complex systems, that's a postmodern worldview on systems. And at the integral level, what I think of as living systems. So here's an example of a building which I would say, even though it's a contemporary building, and I'll use the distinction between contemporary versus modern. Contemporary means now. Modern means inside the modern worldview of the, of the world. This uh, is tacit systems. Tacit systems are essentially things that are embedded. So to the traditional worldview, there is no such thing as an ecosystem. Ecosystems don't exist for the traditional worldview. They don't show up on the horizon of what rises to awareness. They're embedded. They're embedded in the practices. They're embedded in what works. The things have changed uh, little by little, by trial and error, typically over hundreds or thousands of years. And so here's a project that does all those things. You know, It backs up to the north wind. It digs into the site. It creates, you know, it modifies all of the kind of cycles of the climate that are going around there to make this kind of little weekend thing in a hot climate in Texas. 
Now the modern prospect on systems is logical. The modern prospect is interested in the system as a way that it connects. So this is the cellophane house by Kieran Timberlake. It was a, a proposition for the Museum of Modern Art. And it works together in a kind of rationalized, industrialized way with prefabricated parts and things that are reconfigurable. And you can put the whole thing together um, and it comes off of a truck and so forth. And that's a logical kind of way of thinking about how a system works. It's linear, it's abstracted, it's rational, but it's also kind of organic in the sense of organic architecture. That is, you can design from the big scale down to the small scale, and it all fits together in some way. So that's a different view on what a system might be. At the postmodern, and you really have to distinguish here between the lower left cultural perspective of postmodernism and throw away you know, the visual stylistic expression of postmodernism to get your head around the postmodern perspective on lower right systems approaches or lower right systems. What's nature look like? What does reality look like from a, from a lower right systems perspective when you cognitively operate um, at the level of complexity that postmodernism takes into account. So it's very different when you take a lower left perspective of cultures, you say design is what design means inside of the culture. But when you take a postmodern level view on the lower right objective systems, that is nature, right? it sees things as cycles, it abstracts the models, but it places those models into even larger models. So you start to think about how things are connected and how they organize into what we have begun to call things like an ecosystem. So before, I don't know what the date was, roughly 1920, the word ecology and ecosystem didn't exist, right? We had to wait around long enough for humanity to begin to make enough connections to see that there was something like a system out there in the way that we currently conceive of ecosystem as some kind of a web or network of cycles. So here's a building. Uh, this is the one that I talked about in the very beginning. Uh, as another example, the um, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Merrill Center, the first LEED Platinum building. It's really a building that takes water as its theme. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is about cleaning up the watershed. And it begins to look at how the building fits into the context of the water cycle. So they're looking at collecting and storing water. They're looking at restoring and creating wetlands that have been destroyed. They have permeable paving and all of that sort of thing. And then at the level four, what we might call the integral prospect, we start to think about living systems. And that living systems is maybe the most complex way that we're thinking about things now. It doesn't mean that that's the be all and end all of it, and that's the interesting thing about thinking about development. Um, Bob Berkebeil, who's a fairly well-known uh, American uh, sustainable architect, says that what designers are really doing is making nature. It's designing for the ecological pattern. So we have ecological systems in which humans are a part of a larger, or not even a larger, but part of a living ecosystem. So whereas the postmodern perspective is interested in saving nature, the integral pers perspective that sees the world as a living system says you, you can't really pull those apart. We're influencing everything on the planet, even the ice in the Arctic, right? And so there's no such thing as an out there for nature. So here's a project from uh, the Netherlands, uh, a proposal. And you know this is the idea of having a greenhouse in an urban environment and growing food and connecting it up with the needs of the building and making power and fermenting uh, the biomass that's the waste from the greenhouse and using that for biogas and so forth. And so you start to see this whole construction as an integrated set of flows of what it takes to keep life alive on the planet. Here's an example from Sweden where in the city of Stockholm where they're taking a, a whole sector, a whole sort of new town uh, development and extending that same kind of logic. So here's the architecture sort of in the middle where people live 
And then you have all of these kinds of flows of energy, materials, recycling, and so forth, just like a natural system does. So it's learning from natural systems and using those as a model for constructing an urban environment. Okay, so we've got those, what's that? That's two what? Okay, I've got to run then. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have ecological thinking, and that's really what it takes for us, let's see, there we go. So, so what it takes for us, if we're trying to figure out what the ecological patterns are in the lower right, how we have to actually shift our own thinking in our own individual interior from this upper left perspective of experiences, which is also the realm of the individual self. And so there are these different levels of complexity. And so what's suggested here is that each perspective can show levels of development. And that actually it's ourselves that have to begin to look at increasing and changing our own perspective so that we can develop and be able to think ecologically. Now, I'm not making all this up. Um, there's lots of developmental models and systems out there. One of my favorites is quite simple. It comes from Gene Gebser, who's famous in a lot of fields, um, and wrote in 1949 about the epochs of human civilization, in which he called the magic, mythic, mental, and on the top he called it integral. This is a diagram from Sim Vanderen, who's picking up that, and he calls the integral level the ecological epoch. And what's important here is to get a sense of what it is to be an integral, to have an integral awareness from the standpoint of Gebser, which is that at that point, one can then see and integrate all the previous structures. So you can understand what's valuable about the traditional and the modern and the postmodern without rejecting them or judging them. You can, you can really begin to integrate that. And it also lives in a kind of present world, in a concrete, present-centered awareness, which is very different than, let's say, the modern awareness that lives in a sense of linear time, from past to future. And it's aperspectival. That means it doesn't live in one perspective at a time, like the modern consciousness that locates itself in a rational space and takes a viewpoint out there to a particular object, everything in the sort of Cartesian grid. It can take multiple points of view and to take those simultaneously. And this is like really hard and it's also kind of at what I would call the leading edge of human development. And really important here is the notion of the non-identification with the ego. So as human beings develop, what happens is you get less and less egocentric. You, you start off as a human being, as a baby, completely egocentric. The entire universe is about your own self and ego. And as you grow and as you develop, you begin to care about your family, and then at some point you care about other people, and all races and classes and genders and so forth, and you can see that your care and concern and your sense of who you really are also changes. Now, here's what the real topic is. The real topic is uh, ecology is organized on a, a set of ecosystems, use a set of principles. These are from Fritjof Capra. He's really good at boiling it down. It's not just these nine principles, or six, two, four, six principles, <laughs> um, but it could be 30 principles, right? But nevertheless, we do recognize that um, there's lots of cycling that happens in ecosystems, that there are flows of energy and information and materials, that natural ecosystems live on current solar energy income, that there's no waste, that everything is recycled. It's also organized into a network that connects all of these flows and links them up together. And because it's organized in a network, it stays in a kind of dynamic balance. No one variable ever gets optimized, and there's a kind of fluctuation. And when one thing gets out of whack, something else goes into play to help to balance it out. It also turns out that these networks are organized in nested systems, systems inside of systems, in a hierarchical systemic organization and that systems over time show some degree of change and development, in some ways towards greater and greater levels of complexity. So the question is, how do we actually begin to see these things in the world, think about them and design them? And those are the things that require really significant changes in our own perceptions. I'm going to suggest and argue that the fundamental perception is this connection between form and process that that's the essential theoretical imperative for ecological design. Now, form and process 
are fairly easy to understand. Uh, in architecture, we sometimes think about that as form and function. So we've heard the phrase form follows function. That's similar to the notion of anatomy and physiology in medicine. So you wouldn't want your doctor just thinking about your anatomy. You want your doctor also completely intimately understanding your physiology. And now imagine the doctor is going to try and take apart anatomy and physiology. They're going to laugh at you. They can't do it, right? Because they're all working together all the time. And that's how it is, the notion that, that there's process present and there's form present and that those are two sides of an interrelated way of seeing absolutely everything. But we don't really do that all the time. Here's uh, 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 Capra's criteria for living systems. He says you have to have patterns of organization, you have to have structure, and you have to have life process. And those are the three basics. So life process, that's what makes it go. That's the whole things that are flowing and changing. The structure is this object nature. That's what's guiding the way that everything is flowing. It's the hardware. And then the pattern of organization, which is geometry, but it's also the order of things like networks. So there are, I think, six perceptual shifts that are necessary for anybody that's interested in designing in a world in which the landscape is living and we're going to integrate with that living landscape. Um, the Harvard psychologist Robert Keegan says something really interesting. So imagine that what we're talking about is this kind of progression in our own interior development as human beings in order to begin to shift our perception from one way of seeing to another way of seeing. Keegan says what gradually happens is not just a linear accretion of more and more that one can think about or look at, but a qualitative shift in the very shape of the window or lens through which one looks at the world. The world itself actually shows up as a different creation. Nature shows up as a completely different thing, and therefore architecture and design have to respond to that in different ways. The first shift is from objects, or from, from objects to relationships. And so we ordinarily think about things as being quite objective, as being fixed in the universe. Um, but really, we can also understand everything as a pattern of relationships between the parts. So this way of thinking asks the question, and each one of these I'll have a little question for. It says, what are the patterns of ecological relationships in which this design participates. It also asks, how can the patterns of built form be fit to those significant ecological relationships? So just as an example, um, this is the Underwood Sonoran landscape at, at the Arizona State University. So it's a project that is organized around the ecological relationships and the social relationships. It exemplifies the sustainable strategies of water harvesting, climate regulation, air and water cleansing, recycling, urban wildlife habitat, and human well-being. But if you look at this landscape, if you look at this project of a landscape architect merely as a kind of compositional object, as a formal thing, you actually miss every one of those issues. Those issues do not arise. So it's a shift to see how is it that this thing is made up of a set of relationships. Now, each one of these kinds of shifts, you'll see there's actually two shifts there. One is essentially a shift from modern awareness to postmodern awareness. And the third one is maybe a shift more towards the integral awareness. We don't really have time to go into all of those, so I'm just going to kind of focus on the first one for the most part. The sh they're all in the book, though, uh, Susie wants me to remind you. <laughs> There's actually a chapter on each one of these things. So the shift from analysis to context asks us to understand something in the world not by breaking it down, not by trying to understand its constituent parts, but by taking that same thing, whatever your object or whatever your focus of consideration is, and placing it into something larger, placing it into its larger system. So if we take something like a wall or a facade, uh, and we look at it by breaking it down into its parts and saying it's got so much glass and so much insulation and so much concrete and so forth. That's one way of understanding it. It gives us something important. 
But if we then place that same facade into the context of Miami or the context of Winnipeg, our understanding, interpretation of that same wall is completely different. So it's fairly fundamental. And it's something that we're more and more familiar with in design now. Here's just an example of a student project uh, in two different phases, very early studies and a little bit later studies. Um, and this project is set into an urban context which has a, a, a railway on one side and some existing buildings. And so it's trying to understand the context in two ways. One is, what are the patterns of sun and shade that are created by the surrounding buildings and therefore give constraints and opportunities to that particular project? And then, how can that building be shaped and massed in such a way that it's not going to cast a shadow on its neighbor during the times when that neighbor might want the sun? So a very fundamental way of looking at context, but one that completely changes how the project might be shaped and formed. The shift from structure to process, are we looking at the form itself as its anatomy, or do we see its flows and its physiology? Here's an example of an Indian project. This guy's kind of the heir to uh, Louis Kahn in India. His name is Anant Raje. And the process, again, looking at the process of the sun, this is the western facade of this building. and has almost no windows. Now, the intense Indian sun is severe. It is the thing that you design around. And so he's created courtyards. And facing onto these courtyards are large openings, but the large openings are set way back in. With, in, into another layer. And so you can have relatively large openings in a climate that says never have large openings, but by doing that in such a way that it's always looking into another space that's more protected. So it's a fundamental understanding of the process at work and how the farm is completely shaped and organized around that understanding of process. The shift from materiality to configuration Essentially, we're going from looking at the question of what something is made of, which is an important question, to how it's what, asking the question, what is its pattern? So from materiality to configuration goes from asking what is it made of to what is its pattern. And a pattern, in this sense, is a configuration of relationships, and those relationships are process relationships in ecology. So here's sort of the father of patterns in the pattern language, Chris Alexander, in a project that he says is the best example, um, or the most complete example of a set of pattern languages. This is the Aishin School in Japan. It's made up of over 200 kinds of patterns. And the patterns are really about asking the question, what's the pattern of space that goes with some patterns of events, or some patterns of process? Uh, so, just for example, four patterns out of the 200, separate classroom buildings, not a big school. Each building like a house. Gardens between the classrooms. Paths connecting the classrooms exposed to the rain. So you can see right away, just in that, the kind of experience that's possible. I'm not saying this is an ecologically designed building, but that the way of thinking actually does forward a degree of sustainable design about how people experience the place, the elements, the rhythms of the climate, and so forth. And so when you connect a series of patterns into a family of patterns that are related to each other, you have what we call a pattern language. Um, we're using pattern language in this sense in the new edition of Sun, Wind, and Light. That's my book that deals with passive solar architecture, natural daylighting, natural cooling systems, net zero energy architecture, and so forth. Each one of these icons represents an individual piece of architectural knowledge about how to do something important uh, in passive architecture. This whole composition here is what we call a bundle of strategies. And those bundles of strategies are organized in multiple scales, and they're connected to each other in significant ways. And so what we said was, what's important is what's inside this boundary here is kind of significant. And those are the things that you might always want to consider, in this case, when you're designing a passive solar building with a thick plan. That's the nature of the problem. And so the point is that not only is just everything connected to everything else, that's a kind of truism, but they're connected in important ways that 
that hook them up together and in ways that they actually work together to, to solve a kind of recurring problem in design. The shift from parts to holes is, is the shift from how we're going to think about things in piecemeal to how we're going to think about them in their wholeness. And in a sense, I get the direct experience of wholeness when I'm in nature. This is an example of uh, a project in Denmark, which I had that kind of experience of wholeness uh, when I was visiting there. It's uh, a typical European multi-story apartment block with a, a, a big courtyard interior, which originally was a car park, and they turned it into a park for the people. But the interesting thing about this is it's not just a playground and a recreational park. Inside of this glass pyramid is an artificial ecosystem that cleans all of the waste, all the sewage, all the toilet waste from the entire neighborhood development, and then puts that into an outside constructed wetland in different degrees of, this is not, by this point, the tertiary treatment. And so you can go out and have your picnic in the sewage treatment plant in the middle of your block. So that is real closing the loop and giving a sense for me of a kind of living world that we're not isolated from. It's not piecemeal. It's not out there someplace. It's right here and whole and ready for us. And then the shifts from hierarchies to networks. Modern thinking likes trees. Modern thinking likes hierarchies and pyramids. Postmodern thinking says forget hierarchies. Hierarchies are bad because they make power, but that's the, remember, the cultural lower left <coughs> perspective. If we're looking about at systems, hierarchies are good. There's lots of hierarchies out there, but we're going to talk about networks, which is how those process relationships get hooked up together in patterns that make sense and work together to keep things alive. So here's uh, one of my projects uh, working in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. This was the downtown plan, and this is the green infrastructure plan for the city. There were six or eight different organizations involved in the city, and they all had to do with green space, from the city parks to the, there was a national park, to the streets department, to the people that were making greenways, and they were all operating independently, and nobody ever put their green stuff on the map together. So we began to put it all on the map together and ask how we could hook it up, how we could make it into a network with sort of, in a landscape ecology model, having patches of habitat and corridors that connected them, operating inside of some kind of a matrix. And so that's network thinking. We're also looking at how to create this kind of network thinking in um, a sort of multi-hierarchical way. So before I said things were parts and holes, both at the same time, um, that's, that's what we call a holon, and when you hook up holons together, that is things that are both parts and holes, and you organize them hierarchically, we call that a holarchy, and it's a kind of fundamental organization of nature and a fundamental organization inside of a system's view in the lower right perspective. This is just a sample of the entire knowledge base from the new Sun, Wind, and Light book. There are 106 or so uh, strategies and techniques, no, design strategies, 106. In the new book, this is only the largest scales from neighborhoods down to buildings. There's a whole bunch more that go down below that. But you get the idea that you can begin to think about knowledge as a network, too. So those are those kind of six shifts. Here's kind of briefly where we've been. And I just want to remind you one more time what Robert Keegan, the Harvard psychologist, says is really that taking that perceptual shift really is not just more stuff that you're seeing, right? It's a whole new way that the world shows up. It changes absolutely everything about what's possible to exist on the planet for you or for me. Okay. So let me just end here with the notion of this kind of spiral of consciousness. And this is that same notion that Sam Vanderen was taking from Gene Gebser before, which says that we are moving towards an integral awareness or what Vanderen calls the ecologic. I think that we are at the edge of a great cultural transformation. We find ourselves at this place of human development that's been hard won through thousands of generations. 
And we're kind of at this great point of opportunity. And yet, it's not that we need more knowledge. It's not that to make an ecologically sustainable design, we need some more research. We need some more information. We already know a hundred times more than what we're actually doing. Maybe a thousand times more than what we're actually implementing. It's also not that we need to actually get some new brain power. We've got plenty of smarts. We've got all the hardware that we need. You're sitting in a conference about architecture, excuse me, design and ecology, both of those things have a thousand variables. So now you're intersecting two realms that each have a thousand variables. That, just that you're interested in that enough to be sitting here means that you're operating at a, an integral level of cognition and that you have all the hardware necessary and you're all up to the task. So what we really, what there is to do then is to look at rapidly transforming our schools, our practices, and our institutions towards incorporating really significant ecological thinking. You can't do like what my school does, which is look at the beginning of design as point and line and plane, and it's all visual and it's all abstract, and there's nothing living and there's no people and there's no materials and there's no site and there's no context. And that's supposed to be the fundamentals of design. We are not there anymore. We are at a new place. And so what there really is to do for all of us in order to accomplish that is some really hard work that we haven't done yet, is, is all collectively, and Susie said, let's be here together, we have to collectively create a community of learners and thinkers to think ecologically. And we have to create a set of transformative practices that are going to get us there because you don't get there just by wanting to get there. And I'm still working really hard at it, so I'm not saying it's easy. What there is to do, really, is to develop ourselves. To develop ourselves as ecological designers and ecological thinkers in community with each other. I'd like to end with a statement from an excerpt from a poem by Wendell Berry, who lives in Kentucky and farms with mules, and he's a poet. And Wendell Berry says, the field must remember the forest, and the town must remember the field, so that the wheel of life will turn, and the dying be met by the newborn. Seeing the work that is to be done, who can help wanting to be the one to do it? Thank you very much. <laughs>